Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Rare Book Room. My name is Irini, and I help direct events here at The Strand. For a little bit of history, The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 93 years, The Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third-generation owner Nancy Bass Wyden. Under Nancy, The Strand is not only surviving in an increasingly competitive and unsure environment, but it is also thriving. The Strand continues to famously hold over 18 miles of used, new, and rare books, and now hosts nearly 400 events a year. In large part, this is thanks to all of you. Without our loyal community of book lovers, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Didn't think I'd hear that. OK. Tonight, I'm excited to welcome Stephen Sater and his new book, Alice by Heart. <laughs> There's more information. <laughs> Stephen won Tony Awards for Best Book and Best Score, the Grammy Award for Best Musical Show Album, as well as the Olivier Award for Best New Musical for Spring Awakening. His <laughs> His other musicals include Alice by Heart, The Nightingale, Prometheus Bound, Some Lovers, and his plays include Arms on Fire, New York Animals, and a reconceived musical version of Shakespeare's Tempest. Additionally, Sater works as a poet, screenwriter, and pop lyricist. He created television projects for HBO, Showtime, FX, and NBC, and is currently creating a musical TV series for Amazon. <laughs> Very fancy. <laughs> Joining him to discuss Stephen's work is Felicia Fitzpatrick. <laughs> Felicia is regarded as a pioneer of Broadway social media as Playbill's first ever director of social media and creative strategy. I couldn't be more excited to have them both here at The Strand, so please join me in welcoming Alice by Heart today. Um, can, we, can we give some love to Irini? That was a great introduction. Thank you, Irini. All right, Stephen, you, we've got your microphone here, okay. and we're going to be so well hydrated. Okay. <laughs> Y'all, welcome. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so thrilled. Thank you for asking me. Oh, yeah, of course. Because you're you, and The Strand is The Strand, mm. and it is a Friday night, and baby, I'm alive. Um, mm. so, uh, hi. Okay. Wait, let's start at the beginning. A very good place to start. Mm -hmm. You, as noted in your author's note, you loved books growing up. Um, what was your familiarity with Alice in Wonderland growing up? Can I just say something first that this is like, like a dream for me? Right? Because I, um, I, I love The Strand so much, and I um, had so many nights, even after success, you know, in theater, which took a long time, that. And I would just feel, I would walk here, and I love it here, and I would think, oh, well, will I ever have a book here? And so now it really look at you. means a lot to me. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, books, books meant, um, well, I wrote about this in the author's note. I had an odd sort of childhood because I hardly went to school. I was like, I was like in a oxygen tent a lot in a hospital, and I'll, my stayed home and didn't go to school. I was like a sick kid. And my mother had um, gone back to college, mm -hmm. and she was taking a Shakespeare course. In fact, this, this Amazon TV, sh well, this, sh this TV series, um, is based on Twelfth Night. And my mother said to me the other night, she said, you know, that's been with you for so long. And I thought she meant the seven years we've been developing it. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, she, and she said, no, I read you Shakespeare when you were like four and five. So I had this, kind, like books really were my world, especially because I couldn't go outside that much. And um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was not the first book I read, but I, I loved it. And I thought it was so subversive. And um, I read it to my daughter, and I remember how alive she became. I'm probably skipping ahead to the next question, but this esteemed you do what you man, want. my um, you do what you want. Duncan's and my theatrical agent, first said to me, what, in like 2007 or eight or something like that, said, you know, have you guys thought about, have you ever thought about adapting Alice in Wonderland? 
which I think he just was trying to say, like there's imaginative literature that other people have heard of, as opposed to something like Spring Wakening <laughs> at the time. <laughs> um, but that was the beginning of it. Wow, that was the next question, so you did answer it. But what, in terms of like, of wanting to adapt it, since you knew it so well, was that exciting to you? Was that terrifying to you? What I thought was it would never work. What I thought was um, that the book, we had been through such a journey adapting Spring Awakening. And one thing we learned when we introduced songs into the story, you went into the hearts and minds of the characters in a different way. And we had to create heroes' journeys for those characters which don't exist in the original mm -hmm. gorgeous play. And Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, is, the girl is just a cipher. And she's, I don't mean this as a criticism, it's just what the book is. It's this series of sort of hallucinatory incidents visited upon this cipher young girl. And I thought it would never work. So Duncan and I began, this is Duncan Sheik, is who I'm talking about. Who's back hey, there. Duncan. So, <laughs> um, uh, um, we, we were going to do this all music project. We were writing songs. And we wrote, like in 2008, this song, Chill and the Regrets for the Caterpillars, we were gonna, it was sort of gonna be like, you rode the magic carpet ride of each chapter with a song and a music video. And then one night, uh, my friend and our partner in the show, Jesse Nelson, invited me to see, I write about this here too, and invited us to see a concert, uh, well, uh, me, um, a concert of, um, these kids, theater geeks, who knew that they were Beanie Feldstein and Ben Platt and <laughs> Molly Gordon, Casual. to sing um, songs from Spring Awakening. It was called I Believe. And I brought as my guest Leah Michelle, And she was just doing Glee. And I was looking at her and saying, wow, these kids are the age. Because I met Leah when she was 14. That was the first time we. Right. And I thought, oh, this could be a show about how to leave childhood behind. Oh. And so that was what unlocked Alice's Adventures in Wonderland for me. And Duncan and Jesse and I really threw in. We put, spent our own money. We did our first like workshops. We did them with those amazing kids, Darren, Chris. We had these amazing kids, and we did it at um, Har Catherine Gallagher, Harvard Westlake yeah. High School in LA. And then we did another one at the Broad Theater. That's how we began working on the show. So when you started approaching the material, uh, what was the decision behind setting it in London during World War II, like the Blitz? You know, the first decision was that I, and it was Jesse who kept coming back to me and saying that, Stephen, this is what you want to do, which I had said to her. But I wanted to write a, book, a show about a book, about how much a book can mean to you. And so it was never just adapting it. It was always about what this book meant to someone else. And so I had created this conceit of this young girl. And as we worked on the show for a while, um, and we created the love story, and one of the first ideas was if this boy was ailing and dying, then he would be, it would give an emotional thrust to the white rabbit of I have no time, I have no time, I have no time. Wow, yeah. Because he was dying and she was in denial about it. And, um, we were working on the show at the National Theater in London. We were workshopping, and while we were there, was, there was a bombing in the tube station. And I just thought, this is our world today. We live in such uncertainty and terror. And uh, we just all thought, and, it, and it, you know, the tube is underground. It just seemed, and Jesse's dad had been through the war as a pilot, the Second World War. So it just kind of came together. It was an instinctive feeling I had to set it during the Blitz mm -hmm. and talk about, we're living in such a, I, I'm sure we all agree, a dark, chaotic time where, of mock trials and you know, <laughs> mock kings and queens. So I, um, <laughs> it's, it just seemed timely. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and it was in, relevant. In historical context. Yeah. yeah, it was relevant in a new way. So then what was it like in terms of adapting the book to balance your, your guys' uh, musical sensibilities and writing abilities um, and, and the dramaturgy of the Blitz and being truthful to Lewis Carroll's original novel? It was a lot. Yeah. It was a lot to create. I think the main thing was trying to create an emotional through line and also tr to set Wonderland in the heart and mind of a young girl and allow us to go on this journey with her through these rituals, which initially had more to do with puberty, with going through, and then and how to leave childhood behind. And then over time, we worked on the show for a lot of years and we're still working on it, but um, became these stages of grief. 
kind of the familiar Wonderland rituals became kind of like the stages of grief of her getting over the loss of her family and the loss mm. of her city and the, ultimately the loss of this boy she loves. Yeah. And then how did you find, because I feel like that novel is very lyrical in its own way, but how did you find oh. those musical moments uh, as you were adapting? Some of it is instinctive. Yeah. You know, and some of it was relishing the line. One of the first songs Duncan and I wrote was Manage Your Flamingo, which made it all the way through <laughs> the years. And it really comes from a line when she says, the Duchess says to her, manage your flamingo, darling, while you're you know, playing croquet. And we thought, thought it would be like about tucking your sexuality down, your mm. sexuality down. So <laughs> I don't know. We found the iconic moments. And then it, as our story developed, then we, like the song we're going to sing tonight afternoon, that wasn't, it was in the show many years, but it, it was a few years before it was in the show, mm -hmm. before we understood what that story was between those two characters. Yeah. You know, so all the way through our production at MCC, we wrote a new song. Um, and in the summer before, in Poughkeepsie, we wrote, I think, four new songs. So, you know, you're always uncovering new material. Right. Well, that's what I was going to ask, too, of, like, actually bringing it to life on the stage after the adaptation process. Like, what changes did you see from London to America and then to MCC as well? Dramatic changes. Dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> Just so much. I mean, at w um, I think the thing we were always challenging was the fact of how to make Alice an active character going through a journey. And that had to do with the challenge of the source material. Hmm. How, did you, how did you navigate finding those different iterations? What we thought was she because she knows the book by heart, her challenge was to summon it by heart and try and solve his life. You know, and what she doesn't realize is there's no way to solve someone else's life, but she can, hmm. she can work on her own. What, so I, I didn't plan this question, this is on the fly, mm -hmm. but what was the most rewarding song for you to write? Oh, I don't know. You don't even know? You know, I think they're all, I mean, I can tell you that I have, a lot of memories of this song afternoon and I remember Duncan was staying at our house in LA um, when I gave him the lyric and I remember him and we had this out of tune piano and I remember him breaking down in tears writing it off this yellow pad that I'd written the at, you know hand I, I write by pencil Love and it. so Love you know he and then we went in like literally the next day to teach it to Ben and Molly and he broke down in tears again and I, um, you know, so, I, and I remember what the song meant to us both and still does. So. In that moment. Yeah. Well, maybe we should hear it. Maybe we should okay. do a performance of it. Like, that seems, that seems good, right? You guys feel ready? Y'all. So we've got Krista Rodriguez, Alex Boniello, and then we've got Duncan Sheik and Jacob Yates. I mean. Another word 
we fell down a hole. Won't you remember? We fell so far below. We never fell. They're so talented, right? That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, what does it feel like to hear them sing that song in the Strand, this dream come true for you? Well, I just want to say that Krista and Al... First of all, when I asked Krista if she could do this, I... What? 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 Oh. We're okay. We're okay. Okay. I want to thank them for doing this, but I wrote Krista to see if she could do this, and I used her NYU email. That's how long I've known her because I didn't. <laughs> she was in the original company of Spring Awakening, yeah. and then of course they both did the Deaf West revival together. And Jacob has been such a friend playing for all these events for Duncan and me. It's really I'm really grateful to you guys. She's beautiful. So, yeah. <clears throat> yes. So now transitioning to think about adapting the musical into a book, um, when did that conversation happen? What initially sparked that? Um, that was our producer, Kurt, Kurt Deutsch, who mm -hmm. called me and said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we did an Alice book and maybe it could be like a picture book? And I thought this is insane, you know what I mean? That you take <laughs> this classic book and like we've been struggling to try and make this a viable musical for six years and mm. why would I make it another book? And then something about the idea stayed with me, the idea of a book. I read about this in the introduction, but at the beginning of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, she says, what was the use of a book without pictures or conversations? Mm -hmm. And I thought, what about a book in conversation with the Alice book mm -hmm. and also all these other books that have meant so much to me through my life? Mm -hmm. So this book is kind of built on books. Yeah. It's built on, there's a thing, there's a, there was a German writer named Walter Benjamin who died fleeing the Nazis in 1940. And he was writing about Proust, who's m my favorite novelist. And he said, you know, he's, weaving, he's like the opposite, you know Penelope in the Odyssey? Every night is weaving this web, mm. and then in the day she unweaves it so she won't have to marry one of the suitors. And he said that's what Proust is doing with um, remembering and forgetting, and I thought mm. I wanna create a book, like a web out of all the books I don't wanna forget. That's beautiful, I yeah. love that. Well, I also thought that, I know I'm just talking now, but I also I thought that we love at that. a time of so war when, you know, oh, you just look at the world today mm -hmm. and the devaluation of culture. But so I wanted to create a book that could be full of what it means to have a, an education as a young person. Mm -hmm. So there's Euclid in the book and there's Galileo and there, you know, there are all these great English writers who meant so much to me. There are a lot of paintings that are all paintings a young girl could see in 1940. Yeah. London, which have meant to me, I've spent a lot of time in London, so these are paintings that have meant a lot to me too. Yeah. So it's, I don't know, I wanted to create that in the book. Yeah, and because you love books so much, I feel like I you do. can feel that in this book. Um, and so with that in mind, like, where did you begin your adaptation process? Did you start at the very beginning, a very good place to start, or was there a line of dialogue that set you in? It wasn't the dialogue at all, but it was from mm -hmm. the beginning. Well, I was, you know, Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank. And I was like, one night, I was thinking, should I do this book? Mm -hmm. My first editor, Marissa, is here. Somewhere. Where's Marissa? Hey, girl. <laughs> um, and I, um, 
just it just came to me. I couldn't sleep, and I thought Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting on her flimsy cot, and you know, like it <laughs> yeah. just kind of came out of that. Yeah. And I, in fact, I wrote this first part, and it was so poetic. And I brought it into Marissa and Ben, who are the editors. I said, as proof that they didn't want to do this book, that it was <laughs> like, didn't I, I, why am I writing a why a book? This is like so poetic and dense. And they were like, we like this. You should do this. Yeah. So, and you were talking about the element of it being like a picture book earlier. Um, the archival photos yeah. in this book. I was hoping you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, those were something that Jesse and I really uncovered during our our internet research for the show, and they're so heart stopping. I originally wanted our son David to do illustrations for the book, but there wasn't money for illustrations, and there wasn't, and David wasn't showing up, and so I. Um, <laughs> I thought, well, we could have, I still want pictures. Absolutely. So we drew on these archival f- photos, which I think ground the kind of fantastical element of the book, too. Yeah. In the real setting that, Al- where the show is, is mainly happens in Wonderland, even though that Wonderland is within the imagining of a young girl. Mm-hmm. The book is really set in the tube station. Right. It's really like an historical fiction. And it's a good, like, checkpoint, I feel like, when you're reading the book, to see these visuals every so often, to be like, hope so. you know, of like yeah. a visual reminder of what it's supposed to feel like. Yeah. And, and did it feel, when you were adapting it, like a flexing a new muscle, a, a new writer muscle? No. It felt so It felt into. like what I was, had been meant to do for a long time. Wow. It's like when I first wow. wrote lyrics for Duncan, which were the first lyrics I ever wrote. And I had wow. been writing poetry for so long, and I thought, oh, this is something I should do. That's what it felt like writing the book. Did you, did you get writer's block at all while writing it? No. But I, wow. The, okay. <laughs> Show off. But, but uh, we all have our struggles. I, writer's block is not my struggle. Yeah. My struggle is, is editing, rewriting forever and ever, and wanting to make everything, you know? Yeah. I can keep... Susan Sontag once said, my books are smarter than I am because I can rewrite them. Hmm. And that's how I feel, that you can keep pulling more and more the longer you do it. Mm -hmm. It was all they could do to pull the book out of my hands. I still wish I could do another rewrite. Really? I feel like that's a true writer (laughs) moment. Yeah. And and what was it like finding the musical moments now in novel form, right? Like you had to take moments from the original novel and make it musical, and now it's back to novel format. Well, it's finding a different voice. You know, Hmm. I was in the interior monologue of this young girl, Hmm. and there was a place for the poetry of her mom. Should I read that section of what? I think you should read that. I was telling Felicia that that afternoon became in the book. Yeah. So it's a section. So um, it's toward the end of the book, Um, and there's been this big trial. Again, how timely. There's been this big trial, and um, then everything disappears, and Alice is left alone in Wonderland. And so I talk about that, and, um, and the roses are what's left. And then she's, so she's on her own. Um, once more, Alice looked about. The world around her suffused so with rose light, it seemed to offer itself to the view for the very last time. That moment, every flower seems to glow most like itself in that misting hour as the sun declines. Sorry, I haven't seen your rabbit, someone seemed to gossip. Not here, not today. Alice cast about and about. No one there but her, no bird twittering of the plain sense of things from among the leaves, no bathers bathing in some homely stream, no rustic clippers clipping those majestical croquet hedges, no hedgehogs there hedging about. Another wondrous city evacuated. But there, some departing sound, not unlike the dim rattling on distant roofs, the drizzle of shrapnel dropped so methodically it had come to seem part of the day to day. No, it was more like some odd, insistent tick tock, someone's clock. Uneasily, Alice looked about, and there on a lonesome rock lay that rabbit watch his war-scored pocket watch, that worn silver moon casting a, catching a breath on some sunlit ledge. Once more she looked, and there he stood, her white rabbit, the light just catching the furred curve of his ears, so proud in his frayed hospital gown, the perpetual afternoon of his eyes succumbing to the coming pageant of evening. You, she said, His shoulders near shivered, then shrugged abashed. He so polite to the end. Still here, yes, her eyes said yes, as if somehow she knew some deeper self looking on him. Somehow he nodded yes. 
a parting gift, she almost said, but hesitated, for she found herself most with him, only within the silences. And so, with no word said, she looked again and saw him once again, as first she had. Battling the nervy May wind for control of his fluttering paperback pages, every inch the white rabbit already in his double-breasted Edwardian jacket. Now here he stood all these years later, one moment more still him. Though he seemed to be fighting back tears, tears which were not his, or were perhaps not only his, as he said all he said, all he left still unsaid. I can't tell you what it's meant to come here once again, to run here once again. She felt herself nod as if what she looked at were what she were in. And this is her internal thought. Don't let's say more, Alfred, don't let's. But he again, I hope you will remember how it was. She nodded again. In the story, he said, there's no moment of farewell, you know. She knew. Hearing within her that him from the other side of memory, the end sound of a summer without end, don't let it. He once more, and so, with no further word, he turned to go, but she could not, please don't. And the back of him did not, did not go. He could not, not her rabbit, not yet. However, would the sun remain still there? But see the back of him etched there, still there, the back of her rabbit in his waistcoat. She would see him forever, she knew, there by the desolate rock, forever on that hill in Wonderland. Yet once more, he turned toward her. One last look, her Alfred in his frailer robe, forever look there. Again she looked and this time thought, Alice turned one page. I loved him, I still love him, yes. That was beautiful. I want you to read me a story before bed every night when you come to my apartment. Um, do you listen to music when you write? I don't. Because that was so musical, right? Like, there was a rhythm to it. But you I think that's why I don't listen music. to music when I write. Yeah. I listen to music when I write songs. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. No, thank you for sharing that. Um, that was beautiful. What do you when th- I write lyrics for songs. Right, that's, yeah. right, right. Um, what do you think the biggest thing you learned was while you were adapting how much I love being in writing books. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that, you know, Kafka said a writer can never be alone enough. Mm-hmm. And that's what I, I had so many, we all do, you know, I had so many demands for this project and that. And I was in rehearsals for Alice and all I wanted was more and more time alone with the book. Absolutely. So that was what I discovered was my own appetite. Yeah. This is such a big milestone for you and for Alice by Heart. Um, people were wondering earlier, too, would this ever be adapted into a movie? Well, that's a conversation we, we had today. Huh. <laughs> um, I don't know. It's, it would be a great thing. We can secret it into the universe, as they say. Yeah. Well, let's take some questions from the audience. Okay. Um, hi there. Hello in the back. Yes. Do we, ha- do we have mics or should I pass? Yeah, there we go. We've got mics. Hello. Hi. Um, I love your outfit. Thank you. Um, (laughs) So I was fortunate enough to get to see the play, and it was very wonderful. And I loved what you did with not just Alice's character in the play, Uh like how you adapted her character and gave her more depth than the Alice in the book, but what you did with all the other characters and how they represented the different... Um, the different characters in the book Alice in Wonderland, like the Cheshire Cat, the, Mad, the, the Red Queen, the Mad Hatter. And I was curious as to how you came about coming up with the different kind of like deeper backgrounds for the kids representing these characters, mm. like with the Cheshire Cat, with like uh, the girls had a dead sister, I believe, if I recall correctly. Had a what? Uh, had like a sister who passed away or something, yeah. if I recall. So was that something that you came up with as you were writing, or is it something you coordinated with the actors on to come up with? Oh, no, no. That was something we worked on for years and years, and Jesse and I are, were really in deep conversations about those things, you know. It was, actually we were doing reading, with Sarah Bareilles was reading the Cheshire cat and um, Molly Gordon was reading Alice and they're close Jesse worked with Sarah on waitress and Sarah loves Molly and they, we were watching them reading and Jesse said to me they're like sisters and then we just had this thought you know one of us you know what if they were sisters and then we thought it's not good that they're sisters because Alice has lost her family and then we thought well what if 
then why is the Cheshire cat, Tabitha, so drawn to this girl? And then it was like, well, maybe she's lost her sister. So that was, like everything had so many years of development and thinking, you know what I mean? So that was, for example, that's, that's that. Um, the idea of the Mad Hatter and Harold Pudding, the soldier who had lost his wits, you know, that's very, it's just, again, it's so urgent in our world, you know, what we're do, you know, how we're, what our attitudes it are towards soldiers and veterans, and so it felt very timely you know, to look at that. And working with Wes, okay, so this answers your question. So Wes Taylor asked a really intelligent question in, in rehearsal at MCC, and he was asking, he wanted a little more of um, the connection between Harold, the soldier, and do you remember, Rick and Jeff Cooperman, our choreographers are here, and they're so brilliant. Hi. So glad they're here. Um, <laughs> so but do you remember he asked me for, and then Jesse and I talked and we created that moment of like, a, like an egg dro God dropped for kicks. We created this moment in the middle of the tea party, which had never been there where he kind of becomes Harold again. Um, so yes, so you, you are responding to actors, but we had also worked on it for a long, long time. We have more questions. I saw hands earlier, right here in the brown. A mic is coming to you. Thank you. Hi. Um, so with things like the egg dropping in the middle of that song, um, it's not in the cast recording, and I was just wondering why. Oh, no, it's not in the, it's not in the song. It's in the scene. Is oh. that what you're talking about, yeah. that, that scene? No, it's in the scene. Cool. Thank it's you. It's before the song, yeah. Awesome. Oh, in the, yes, in the glasses. Hello. Um, this is kind of a similar question, but... For the character of Tabitha and the Cheshire Cat, um, in the book, the Cheshire Cat, I think, is more perceived as like a trickster kind of character. Mm -hmm. But with the musical, she's more of like a helpful person mm -hmm. that's like there to support Alice through everything. What made you decide to change the character in that way? It was really, um, I don't know, wanting Alice to have a guide and what would a guide mean and what, you know, she's still, the thing is in our show, the Cheshire Cat is really tough with Alice. She's the one who busts her again and again about being in denial and kind of gets her to finally um, admit that this boy is dying. So she's not just loosey-goosey supportive, she's tough. Um, but I, you know, I think in the theater you want I don't know. I mean, I, the writers I love create rich three-dimensional portraits of people who have, you know, many sides and are like all of us. You know, if, if if we should be judged according to our desserts, who would escape whipping? Hamlet says, you know. So everyone's, you know, messed up, and um, it just seemed like to have this girl who'd been living on the streets, who'd been living without a family, who had a kind of wisdom, who had had to earn her smile through so had to earn that grin because of having come, ang come out on the other side of grief. That just seemed pertinent to today for us. So that's what it was. Is that another hand? Yes, right over here. A mic is on its way. Um, I had two questions about um, song order. Actually, secondly, one question, but um, there are two, two scenes in, with, in the show and the book that are interesting with um, going from the Duchess to the Met, to the Mad Tea Party. It's the one scene that, that goes in the same order as the book. Say again, the Duchess to the Mad Tea Party. It's also, yes, it's the same order in, in both the show and the book. It's the only scene like that. And it's also the one that um, Alfred um, brings them to. And. Um, and the Jabberwock is the one scene from Through the Looking Glass, not from Alice's Adventure or uh -huh. Wonderland. Is there a significance to those? Well, so the things? idea was um, that Alice, that Alfred brings Alice to the tea party to punish her for not realizing how sick he is. For the, in other words, the hurt you do to someone by not admitting they're going to die. I was wondering, because um, Alfred's much more focused on it's a it's a change for him it's a step in his journey to to be less by the letter right to in order to have a lesson to for Alice and then in the show it really backfires or properly it leads to his exhaustion and his collapse um, 
the through the looking glass moment I really resisted because it was so all the Disney movies basically all the Alice in Wonderland movie you know they take the best bits from both books and I was really rigorous about wanting to only do Alice's Adventures in Wonderland but it just seemed I, I was a boy who had a lot of doctors around me talking in language I didn't understand and I think we're living in a time in the world where language is being used against us and it was really important to me to see how like language can be used as a hideous tool and um, I just it was one night after three hours of talking to Jesse she convinced me to go ahead and do it and so I, I wrote this lyric and gave it to Duncan and he really responded to it. so it was, that's what it came out of and, I, and then I had lines in it like the, Alice was going so crazy that the looking glass of her mind had shattered and this character from the other world had come in in the other book and I was convinced by my probably smarter partners that no one knew the difference between the two books and I was just going <laughs> to confuse everyone by explaining that and I was convinced I was going to be ridiculed in the press for it. But um, so, yeah, I'm aware. It, it felt significant cause, because of that. Cause I, I watched a lot of adaptations, though, and you noticed that it was the one, one thing not from. Yeah, I understand. Any other questions? Oh, yes, hello, second row. Uh, they're bringing a mic to you. Got to amplify the theater. Hi. Um, Look at you. You're so, um, for a lot of us who only got to listen to the cast album, is there anything in particular that you're excited for us to get to experience that we didn't get to experience in the cast album? You mean in the book? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's very different. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> There's such a different person you are when you're listening to music, when you're reading a book, mm -hmm. to me. And so, you know... Um, to me, books are about this sub-vocal exchange you have with another mind, with the mind of the author and with the life of the character and the identification you can have as a reader. Whereas in a show, you have this whole experience of in the, in the public discourse of the theater, mm -hmm. right, with the performers. With a cast album, I think it's different too. You know, you're listening to songs, you're grooving on the music. This is, this is more the story of a young girl's mind and a young girl, young girl's victory over her own demons. I think we have time for one more, and I saw you on the end of that same row, right there, yeah. Hi, um, I was wondering how you were able to so clearly, because I also saw the show, how able to so clearly um, capture a fantastical and wondrous world like Wonderland, while also in the setting of something so like dark and gloomy, there's still, and even like the color palettes of the show itself were very muted, but you still got the very like magical aspects of Wonderland through that, like how did you figure out how to do that? What was important to all of us in creating the show was to say that the the, to affirm the power of the imagination in dark and chaotic times. So it was not to say we are in, um, I don't want to put down other projects, uh, movies, but you know, where you, you're fantastically going to some other place and you're pulling a string and you're suddenly dressed. It was about what can the imagination pull forth from the real world where we are. I really believe that, I know this sounds like a stupid thing to say, but that the world is and that we live so much in our own heads and that's part of Alice's struggle. She's in her own mind. She thinks she can convince, she can make it that this boy is well and she can't, right? She can adjust her attitude to the world. And so I, I think the harsh reality of that world, we wanted it to be present. In the, that, that's the, the secret is to find the wonder in the life you're living, not to pretend to live somewhere else. That's what we were trying to say. And with that, I think it's time to wrap up. But thank you so much to Alex and Kristen and Duncan and Jacob and to you, Stephen Sater.